What's up, eco nerdlings? In this podcast, we're going to be taking a look at our freshwater ecosystems. So let's get started. Freshwater ecosystems have a very low salinity level compared to that of their saltwater ecosystems in the ocean. Freshwater ecosystems include lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, as well as inland wetlands. Some freshwater ecosystems are classified as lintic, meaning that they contain standing water. Others are classified as lotic, meaning that the water is continuously moving. So I always remember the difference between these two as lotic has a lot of water movement. So lotic, a lot of water movement. Make sure you know the difference between these two. I wouldn't be surprised if you had a free response question over them. Just keep that in mind. So freshwater lakes is what we're going to start out with. They form in depressions that are made by glaciers, volcanic activity, or movement of Earth's plates. In the lake, we have a littoral zone. This is near the shore, and it contains the shallow sunlit waters. Also has a lot of floating plants. Uh, some of the plants get emerged by water. Some of them uh, are in an area where they're sometimes emerged, sometimes not. We have a high biological diversity in this area due to the presence of photosynthetic plants, as well as algae. We also have the limnetic zone. This is also sunlit, but it's a little bit further out from the shore. So here we have our limnetic zone. It's going to be our ocean water, or excuse me, our open water. Most of the photosynthesis in the lake occurs here in the limnetic zone, and it's the majority of the food and oxygen in the lake is also produced here. So limnetic zone right here, again, we're gonna have photosynthesis going on in the top layers that the sun can uh, penetrate. So the benthic zone is going to be the area near the bottom of the lake. Just like in the ocean, this layer is inhabited mostly by decomposers feeding on detritus that's basically raining down from above. Ecologists will actually classify lakes based on their nutrients levels as well as their biological productivity. The two main types of lakes are considered to be oligotrophic, and oligotrophic lakes are going to be very low in nutrients oligotrophic lakes, low in nutrients. Oligo is low. We have populations of plankton and algae in these areas that are going to be very low. So if we have producer levels that are very low, that obviously means they're not going to be able to support a lot of consumers. So when productivity is low or primary productivity, you're not going to see a lot of different types of consumers in that area. The second type of lake is considered to be eutrophic and eutrophic lakes have a very great concentration of nutrients. This removes a lot of the growth limiting factors of algae and plankton. So we're gonna have huge primary productivity in these areas. Sometimes the primary productivity actually gets too high and it takes over and we don't see a lot of consumers. Most of the time high productivity is going to be a good thing though because the more primary producers there are, the more consumers we're going to be able to support. Then we have our rivers and our streams. So there's a difference between streams versus rivers. Streams are going to be narrow channels of water that often begin in mountainous areas where water from melting snow or glaciers moves very rapidly across rocks and down waterfalls. Rivers are formed whenever streams actually combine with each other as well as with the runoff water from the surrounding land. The water in the source zone is generally going to be cold, it's going to be rich in oxygen, and very low in nutrients. So up here you see our source zone, that's where it's going to originate. So sources for this include rain and snow, as well as glaciers, lakes, and then we have rapids forming right here. As that water moves through the transition zone, the streams start to widen, they become a little bit deeper, and they're warmed by the sun. So our transition zone is going to be right here. Oxygen levels actually start to decrease, but the nutrient levels start to rise because they're starting to gain some of this little bits of runoff. So low-lying areas called the floodplain zone experience wide or slow-moving rivers that will occasionally flood and start to deposit material that had come from upstream. So our floodplain zone is going to be right down here. And again, all of these nutrients and sediments that are collecting as we're going through our transition zone are going to start to get deposited down here in the floodplain zone. And the water continues to warm as it goes down, 
oxygen levels also continue to decrease, and the nutrients continue to increase. So the river eventually ends in a larger body of water called the river mouth, just like the mouth of the Mississippi. The fresh water mixes with salt water and it forms what we call brackish water. So right here would be the mouth of the river, right here. New Orleans is actually built on the mouth of the Mississippi. And the soil here is very, very loose, and that's the result of thousands upon thousands of years of that sediment being deposited by the river. At one point, the city was actually near sea level. However, as we built all of the levees and the dams that were constructed, the river flooding stopped and the sediment no longer uh, was deposited. Now, at first this was a good thing, but we've realized now that it has actually caused the city of New Orleans to start to sink. So as the city began being built up, it sinks lower and lower and lower into the ground. And this process is called subsidence. It occurs at a rate of about two inches per decade and it's accelerated by withdrawals of the groundwater, oil, as well as natural gas. And this has created basically like a bowl effect for the city. So anytime it rains real heavy in New Orleans, you see a lot of flooding in the streets because there's not a lot of drainage and there's not a lot of uh, space for that water to go because it's so saturated and it's actually below sea level at this point. So the last type of fresh water we're going to talk about is inland wetlands. These are located away from coastal areas. Inland wetlands are non-permanent bodies of water. We have different types of wetlands. We have marshes, we have swamps, we have bogs. So marshes do not have trees, whereas swamps do. And then bogs are wetlands that are characterized by plants that actually produce an acidic secretion that slows down the action of decomposers. So if you go into a bog, you're going to you're going to have a lot of different smells going on. It's not a very pleasant place to be. So as a major shipping port, New Orleans has actually built canals to allow ships to move through uh, their area more easily. Now, an unintentional consequence of building all of these canals has been that it's actually allowed the salt water to intrude further and further inland than normal. Now, having all of that salt water kills off a lot of those freshwater wetland plants. So that's one of the downfalls of human intervention or human impact on some of our ecosystems that are aquatic. Well, I hope this video was helpful. If you'd like to rewatch this one or any other AP Environmental Science videos, you can find them at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off. Stay nerdy till next time.